So we have talked about the involvement, of course, of the university in Kumasi, IITA, USDA, ARS, and the Ministry of Food and Agriculture of Ghana. But we should not forget that the farmers were instrumental in the, in the development of the product. Some of them are over here. So thank you very much for participating and to be uh, big supporters of the initiative. So thank you. So the major uh, causal agent of contamination is Aspergillus flavus. Other Aspergillus species are occur in some areas and the composition of these communities is influenced by cropping systems, climate, elevation, elevation, rainfall, and also other factors. But within these species, Aspergillus flavus, there are some individuals, some families that are not able to produce any aflatoxins at all. This is a representation of different families of these species of Aspergillus. Just to let you know that some of these have no ability to produce aflatoxins, and we use those ones as biocontrol agents. In this other, other picture over here, you can notice that each one of these uh, triangles or the blue dots, that means different genetic defects that make these isolates unable to produce aflatoxins. These occur naturally. There's nothing that we do to modify this uh, aflatoxin biosynthesis gene cluster. So this, this is something that has occurred over thousands of years. Some of the isolates or the strains contain deletions and some other co contain no genes at all. So there are different reasons for atoxigenicity. Now, in 2012, a study started to determine what was the prevalence of uh, contamination in, in maize and groundnut across Ghana. This was conducted by Daniel over here. This is part of his doctoral research. And you will see that all across Ghana, there, are, there were samples that were collected for us to be able to determine what was the prevalence of the aflatoxin contamination problem, but also to determine presence or absence of atoxigenic fungi for use as biocontrol agents. So at almost 1,000 atoxigenic strains were identified, and from these 900 plus, four of them were selected to constitute the AFLASAFE product, AFLASAFE GH02. Now, these are, this is a representation of the four different families that when we grow them in sterile sorghum, these reproduce after a few days, then we harvest these this, uh, spores and we combine it with a, with a polymer and with a blue food colorant to create aflasafe. So this is aflasafe. Each one of these grains contains some tiny amounts of spores that are sticked to the grain. So, the aflasafe product contains sorghum that is sterile, so when the farmer is spreading it in the, into the field, it's not going to germinate. This is just to allow us to distribute the strains in the crop. And this is what it looks. A farmer uh, holding here aflasafe, we cannot see those spores, but those are over there. And when the right conditions occur in the field, this is what happens. These spores are starting to reproduce, and from here, these are going to be moving into the crop and that is going to result in the protection. So this is what happens. In fields that are not treated, the plant is growing and also the community of Aspergillus increases as well. And most of the time, all of the community or most of the community is composed of aflatoxin producers. So what we do is that we apply aflasafe just before this natural increase we apply it two to three weeks before flowering. And instead of having a crop associated with the toxigenic community, we have a crop that is associated with the aflasafe fungal strains. So this is a very simple intervention. We are just dictating which community is going to be associated with the crop. And we do this without uh, increasing the, the uh, density of Aspergillus propagules in the environment. So this is a farmer applying Aflasafe during these efficacy trials. And this simple intervention results in little to no aflatoxin contamination. We can say that over 99% of the maize and also of the groundnut contains less than four parts per billion. This is uh, below the, the, EU, the EU regulatory limit. And a little bit of it contained a little bit more, five to 30 parts per billion. Yes, but this is 
It's not, it's not below the threshold of the EU, EU but it's, it's better than having crops with maybe over 100 parts per billion or even over 900 parts per billion. So this is a very effective technology that results in the majority of the crop containing very safe aflatoxin levels. So for the testing of the, of the Aflasafe uh, product, you will see that each, in each one of these dots represents different fields, groundnut and maize, and training and sensitization campaigns occurred in each one of these regions. So farmers were also trained to apply the Aflasafe product. And Daniel and a team of uh, the university and also the Ministry of Agriculture collected the samples. We only teach the farmers how to, how to treat the product. This is something that was conducted in their fields. It's not something that occurred in, the, in a research station where we have control of all of the variables. No, this, is, this was done with the farmers. And as I mentioned, some of them are over here and we can, we can uh, discuss this after my presentation or you can discuss that with, with them. So these are the results. You will see that, that in the different regions over here, those crops that were not treated contain very unsafe aflatoxin concentrations, up to 900 parts per billion in summary. This, these are summaries of 30 to 40 fields in each one of these regions. But take a look in comparison, the treated ones in most cases had zero aflatoxins. So uh, the reductions that we detected were from 96 to 100% in this specific year. It worked for groundnut and also for maize. So there are not too many technologies that can reduce a problem in a manner that Aflasafe does, and specifically those Ghanaian products that are very effective. All of this data, the efficacy trials, and also other, other uh, different studies were submitted to the uh, Environmental Protection Agency of Ghana. And just about two months ago, we received approval for registration of the product. Now, this is the label approved by, the, by Ghana EPA. You will notice over here this green label. This means that this is the safest biopesticide possible in any place in the world. This is a, a label granted by the World uh, Health Organization, so there's nothing else. There's no other uh, level of safety that a biopesticide can, can achieve. So this is very, a very safe technology. Yes. So, uh, as, as we mentioned, it, this is not an initiative. Aflasafe is not an initiative only developed for Ghana. We have this initiative for other 17 countries at different stages of product development. But this is a summary of what happens in the maize fields that we have examined. In those that have been treated with Aflasafe, we have around four parts per billion in average, sometimes a little bit more, in many cases zero. But those fields that have not been treated with Aflasafe, we have in average 160 parts per billion. Some cases, yes, those levels are low. In many other cases, those levels are extremely high, 1,000, 2,000 parts per billion. But these benefits that we obtain at harvest, also we obtain them after poor storage. We do not recommend to store under, under suboptimal conditions, but if those conditions occur and the crop has been treated, we still have some protection, a very, uh, not uh, almost 10 times more than the levels at harvest, but 90% less than those crops store under suboptimal conditions, but that were not treated with Aflasafe. So we have benefits both at harvest and also after poor storage. So this is data from over 1,000 farmer field efficacy trials and also commercial usage of the product in, in Nigeria. So, uh, Biological control of aflatoxins using Aflasafe products is our signature technology, but it's not a silver bullet. We recommend it along another package of technologies that are going to help us obtain the lowest level of aflatoxins present in the crops. So it's not only Aflasafe, it's a whole uh, range of other technologies that help us obtaining crops with low aflatoxin concentrations. And of course, this is not going to reach the, the farmers by, by itself. We need to have technology transfer and licensing agreements for manufacturing, distribution, and commercialization. This is part of what Abdu explained in the initial, in the initial presentation. So this is the Aflatox, the Aflasafe uh, manufacturing facility in Nigeria. 
this was the first manufacturing facility for this type of products in Africa and three across the world. It's, uh, it's, it's where AfterSafe is being produced right now. In Kenya, we have a manufacturing facility that is, that is different from this initial one. This has been improved and it, co it consists of different modules depending on the capacity of the, of the industry and also the demand. These modules can increase for us to be able to meet those AFLA safe needs in the, by the farmers. So once uh, a company from Ghana uh, wins this, this licitation, they, they most likely are going to be having one, one of these facilities constructed. Now, what are the benefits provided by using AFLA safe? Well, we just saw those, those uh, results from the efficacy trials. In most cases, zero aflatoxin. So we are going to be having no aflatoxins or very little concentrations of aflatoxins in the crops that are consumed, groundnut, sorghum, and maize. So because of that, there's going to be improved health and nutrition of people, especially women and children. Increased livestock productivity and profitability when using aflatoxin safe feeds, when those feeds are manufactured with afla safe treated crops. And also greater trading opportunities in domestic and international premium markets. This is going to result in higher income for farmers, aggregators, and traders. So, as, as Abdu mentioned in the initial, in the initial uh, presentation, this is not something that we do just a few number of people. This is a very large effort that has been possible through almost 15 years of research in Nigeria, in Ghana, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in many different places. And this has been possible because of the large number of, of uh, donors and governments that have been supporting this initiative.